Here's an example of finding the absolute maximum and minimum of a function of two variables on a bounded region. In this case, a disk. Uh, it's going to be a unit, the unit disk. Um, this is a relatively simple example, just to start with. Um, so here's the function. f of x, y is 3x squared plus 4y cubed. And we'd like to find the absolute max and the absolute min of that on the standard unit disk, where x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. And um, let's, let's look at the graph of that sucker. I've graphed it just on the disk here. And you can see that it's got a flat spot. It's kind of like a chair. It's got a flat spot right in the middle. And so we're going to uh, find that critical point in a minute. And then there's going to be some constrained critical points. If I look at this from the top, you can see I'm just interested in this on the disk. And I want, I'm going to look at it around the boundary to find out what the values are, are looking like on the boundary. And in general, when you've got a problem of a constrained uh, optimization problem on a region, you're going to want to find critical points on the interior and look carefully at the boundary. It's the analog of looking, checking the endpoints for a, a problem in single variable calculus, but the boundary of the region here is a whole curve, not just two points. So let's go back. Okay, so the first step is going to be uh, check the interior. Just look for ordinary critical points in the interior, and those are plausible uh, possibilities for the max and the min. We saw in the picture that those aren't going to be the max and the min here, but if you don't have that picture in front of you, that's not at all obvious. So we want to check the interior, and so we're just going to set the gradient of f equal to 0, or in other words, fx oops, equal to 0, and that's 6x, and fy equal to 0. Oops, uh, that's uh, 12y. Okay, so I picked something that's really simple. It's clear right away that just xy has to be the 0, 0. Just the origin is the only actual critical point of this function, the only unconstrained critical point of this function. Okay, and f of xy is equal to 0. So just like in one variable calculus, like BC calculus class, we're going to make a list of possible points, which include the the ordinary critical points in the interior, and we're just going to look at the values of the function on that, those points. And then if I picked this one to be easier. Okay. Second step is the boundary. Okay. And I'm going to do two ways. Um, and this really two out of three. There's another way that we'll talk about in the next section called Lagrange multipliers, which is very slick and very powerful, but we haven't learned that yet. And so the more straightforward way is I'm just looking at this function again. Now I'm only looking at its values on the circle, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that into a function of one variable, because there's really only one variable you need to describe the values on that circle. Okay, So um, that means we basically have to parameterize that circle. And one way is just to recognize that um, the boundary is where I take that inequality that describes the whole region and I set it to an equality, change it to an equality. And so in other words, y is going to be plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, so now already that's annoying because there's two pieces to it. And that means uh, I've also got to worry about uh, where those two pieces join because this is not a nice function when y is equal to 0. It's the, the two places where the, the circle turns vertical and the derivative of y as a function of x is not, is not nice. So um, I can do this, but the issue or the problem, and it's not, I'm not saying it's a horrible idea, but the problem is that that's two pieces, and need, we need to check where they meet. And this is a very common thing is that you're going to take the boundary, like a circle here, you might have to break it up into pieces, and then you will have to check a few points specially. OK, so now there is one, um, one thing that's nice here. Oh, and it's also, we could also do x equals, and we actually are going to end up doing, this, doing it this way, x equals plus or minus root 1 minus y squared. OK, and it's not clear which, one, which variable we'd like to solve for until we go back to the equation. Either way, this breaks it up into a top and a bottom half, and we're, we would have to check the left and right endpoints. And here it slices it up into a left and a right half, and we'd have to check the top and the bottom um, separately.
Okay, so let's look at our function. It actually has a nice form that's going to tell us which of these is going to be better. Plus. Okay. Aha, that x squared is just dying to be put into here. That's just 1 minus y squared. Okay, so that's going to be 3 minus 3y three squared plus 4y cubed. Okay, so we can do it as a function of y, and this plus or minus, luckily, in this example, goes away because this, thing, this function is actually symmetrical across the y-axis. When I look at this function and I change x to minus x, it's symmetrical. We can see that in the plot. Okay, you can see here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis. You can see that symmetry across the y-axis. Okay, so we're looking at the circle here. It's a little tilted, I know. It, Looking at this, look, get it down. Oh, actually, let me see. Um, view x, y plane from above. There we go. Okay. It doesn't look like a circle because I'm kind of looking at this weird, slopey thing in perspective, but it really, really is. is uh, actually, let's see. Um, 3D view. Oh, no. That's not what I want. Um, I know there's a way to take it to. Uh, but I'm forgetting how to how to change the perspective. Oh yeah, change the parallel projection. There we go. Okay, so that's like looking at it from infinity. Okay, so I'm looking at this circle, and I'm look I'm going to be looking at this half. Oh God, I didn't mean to do that. Um, x y plane from above. Okay, um, I'm looking at this half where x is plus root one minus y squared, and this where x is minus root one minus y squared separately. But luckily, there's a symmetry. And what I was talking about with joining is that that's not going to pick these points out, and we're going to have to make sure we account for those separately. So, at least though, we've got a function, okay, now we want to take it back to an ordinary one variable calculus optimization problem. We need to know what the boundaries of y are. Well, uh, y is going from minus 1, because those are the, these are the values of uh, y that y could have on the circle, to 1. And it's exactly those endpoints, minus 1 and 1, that we're going to have to check separately. So it's not super surprising. If somebody, if you handed somebody this one variable calculus problem, they'd say, what's the interval? You'd say, that's the interval. And they'd say, oh, I better check the endpoints. And that's those two places where the two halves of the circle are going to join. OK, so now, um, so f prime, so now it's really just a function of y. Let me just call it f of y. It's a little bit of an abusive notation. OK, f prime of y is going to be minus 6y plus 12y squared. Aha, we set that equal to 0. So y is either equal to 0 or um, equal to 1 half. OK. And um, that, oh, and yeah, y equals either 0 or 1 half. And let's throw in minus 1 and 1 for good measure. OK, so now f of y on that boundary, I'm just going to plug it back into the function here and find out what those values are at those points. Okay, f of 0 is 3. f of 1 half is 3 minus 3 fourths plus 1 half. Uh, I don't have to get the calculator to do that. So that's 12 fourths that's not what I meant. 12 fourths minus 3 fourths plus 2 fourths is 11 fourths. Okay. F of 1 equals 3 minus 3 plus 4, so that's 4. And F of minus 1 is equal to 3 minus 3 again and then minus 4. Just minus 4. OK. So here we see that. And then remember, the center was f of two variables, f of 0, 0, was equal to 0. OK. So absolute max is really f of, so here we were abbreviating it as f of y, but it looks like the maximum value is going to be where y is equal to 1, and that's equal to 4. So that's really f of um, 0, comma 1. Because when y is 1, x is 0. And the absolute min 
f of 0 minus 1 is equal to minus 4. So let's look at the picture, and that's really what we, what we could see from the picture, that the max is up here on the positive y-axis and the min is down here on the minus y-axis. Fairly obvious from the picture, but again, not obvious necessarily from the formula. And what else is it detecting? It's detecting that if you are totally unconstrained in the interior, you have a flat point here, that's a critical point, and if you walk around the boundary, you notice that as you walk around the boundary, there's a point here along the x-axis, which is a little local min just along the boundary, and then a little bit up from there, where y is one half on both sides symmetrically, there's a little local min or constrained local min that if you are only looking around the boundary, that guy dips down and it gives a little minimum. It's not a minimum in any other sense because you can go lower by just going inside and you can go higher by either going along the circle this way or going out if you were allowed to do that. But as a function on a circle, it actually is an inter these guys are interesting points and that's the y equals one half that we're detecting. Okay, so I don't want to make this too long, but I did want to show you one other way to think about this. Where's my thing? Okay. Um, oh yeah, one thing to notice is that if we had only done the interior, we totally would have missed the boat completely. This is was really not close to being correct for absolute max or min. And if we had looked at this, done x equals plus or minus root 1 minus y squared, looked at this function, and not looked at the endpoints of that guy, which corresponded to the top and bottom of the circle, then we would have missed the boat. Because in fact, the absolute max and min weren't uh, at where any derivatives were equal to zero. It was where these two halves joined. Okay, so now, um, second way is there's a nicer way to parameterize the unit circle. We could set x equals cosine theta and y, oops, I don't need to do that, y equals sine theta, and then, well, I know that, and then f of theta, kind of abusing notation, is going to be um, 3 cosine squared, not to the 23rd power, theta, plus 4 sine cubed theta. And the cool thing about that is that that just runs all the way around the circle, 0 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to 2 pi, and there's not really an endpoint there. Um, as long as I just go all the way around the circle, this really should everything should show up as a critical point. So that's nice because there's no seams. I'm going to run all the way around the circle, and theta really could go for any real number. It's just kind of redundant once I get beyond 0 to 2 pi. So this is a problem without endpoints because it's really living on a circle, even though I've said it look, makes it look like it's an endpoint problem. I really want to have to check those separately. Okay, so I know that. I'm not trying to do that. Okay, now f prime of theta. Um, I've turned it into a one variable problem in a bit of a different way, a different parameterization of the circle, and that's going to be 6 cosine theta, ooh, minus 6 cosine theta, sine theta. You'll see that it looks pretty similar in some ways. Plus 12 sine squared theta, cosine theta. Set that equal to 0. Well, again, there's... I don't know why I keep doing that. Just keep hitting the wrong button. So we've got a common factor, sine theta, cosine theta, times, oh, actually 6, a little factor out of 6, times 2 sine theta minus 1 equals 0. And so what do we discover? It's that either sine theta equals 0, okay, that's going to be where theta equals 0 or pi, and that's those points along the x-axis where y equals 0, okay, that we discovered already, or cosine theta equals 0. So that's going to be theta equals pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. That's the points along the y-axis that we actually had to be really careful to find, uh, but now they're coming out automatically. Or uh, sine theta equals 1 half, and that's going to be where theta equals pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. Okay, and now what we really want is to translate back to x and y, but that's easy because y is just equal to sine theta and x equals cosine theta. So these are going to translate to where y equals 0 
or let's let's just get the x and y points. x y cosine comma sine of zero or pi. That's going to be one comma zero, or minus one comma zero as before, or x y equals zero one, or zero minus one as before, or x y equals um, root three over two comma one half or minus root three over two. Ooh, that's an over comma one half. Notice those root three over twos never showed up in the other one because we were able to just focus on y. Um, here I could I could just focus on theta here and then just plug them in to this function of theta. That'd be fine. But since I really care about x and y, I might as well go back to the x and y's. So here we're going to get this, these points, and then again, of course, we just make the list f of 1, 0 equals, and we're going to get those same values, and we're going to get the same um, accounting for max and min. So the, the punchline for that, the second part, is think about a nice way to parameterize the boundary. And sometimes things like cosine theta, sine theta are nicer. Um, and prettier, and they might, especially if there's a way to parameterize the whole thing all at once, as opposed to this, which explicitly chops it up into two pieces, and then you have to make sure you remember where the pieces meet. So the second way is more elegant, um, but the first one for this particular problem was fine. If this hadn't been a square, though, uh, this would have been pretty ugly, and the other one might have been nicer. Okay, I think that's finally done.